Hello, everyone. It's 6 p.m. on October 12th. Welcome to our 2021 talk on native seed propagation as part of Project Swallowtail, hosted by Pollinator Partnership Canada. My name is Janaith Khan, and I work as an ecologist with Pollinator Partnership Canada, and I'm the coordinator for the Project Swallowtail program, along with my colleague Kathleen Law. And as with all of our talks, um, I would like to start off by acknowledging the land that we all get to share um, this learning on today. And uh, as always, I'd like to invite you to take a minute or a moment to really reflect how it is that this land has uh, given to you, how it is that you can relate um, with the learnings that you will undertake today and how they can um, be part of a reconciliation action in your own life. Uh, so I would very much like to acknowledge that much of the biodiversity and concepts that we're going to talk about today really only exist because of the long-standing stewardship of Indigenous peoples across this land for thousands and thousands of years. Um, this includes the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron, the Wendat, and many other tribes and peoples that have traded and traveled on this land long before you and I ever got here. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our star speaker, Dr. Pete Ewens, who was born in Workship, England, and holds a doctorate in marine ornithology from Oxford University. Pete has worked tirelessly over the last over two decades in the field of conservation. And in 1990, when he moved to Canada, he worked until 1996 on the Great Lakes Wildlife Toxicology Programs and has and since joined World Wildlife Federation Canada as the director of Canada's endangered species, um, as, the, as the director of Canada's endangered species program and continued to build long lasting partnerships and programs through his work there. And now I hazard to say that Pete is retired. He is the busiest retired person I know. He is uh, a, a wealth of knowledge on the steering committee for Project Swallowtail. And today we're going to get to hear his expertise on native plant propagation, something that has really uh, expanded in uh, something that has really become a huge part of Pete's life over the last few years. We had some technical issues at the start of the recording here, so I apologize that we're going to be jumping right in, but I'm going to pass it off to Pete. Jonathan's re-recording it. So here's my garden and uh, running it evolved from asphalt to lawn and when the kids didn't want to play water hoses on the lawn anymore, half of it was dedicated to native plants and in a couple of years it basically didn't need any intervention and it should. So that's my source of uh, seed for a whole bunch of species. In total in my garden I've got about 100 native plant species. So I can monitor daily and pick the seeds when they're exactly right. So here we are, seed collecting, spring ephemerals, uh, what's that, foam flower, Jacob's ladder and wild um, columbine. Yeah by the end of June and early July, you're, if you haven't got those seeds you're almost too late to collect them. So you've got to watch them and the rule of thumb is when they're brown and dry looking um, just go collect them and you know if you're if you're in someone else's garden or a public area you know don't take any more than 10 percent of the seeds there and you hope that no other person's going to come along and take another 10 percent ad infinitum but those things you've got to get going early um, how do you tell whether the seeds are ready? Well, brown and a bit crispy looking. And you, if you're monitoring it fairly regularly, you can see the transition. And in some species, it's quite sharp and fast. Here on the left, those are, I think, green-headed coneflowers. Those are exactly the right time. The goldfinches and other seed eaters haven't got at them. Top right, that was uh, two and a half weeks ago, blue vervain and uh, purple coneflower, exactly ready for taking the seeds and then the bottom right is tall meadow rue that's most of those are not ready yet um they are ready um about last week actually for harvesting nice and brown but green and yellow best not to take them off their stalks 
uh, top left is nice black big seeds of the um, nodding wild onion. Um, if you're crazy enough to want to collect seeds of common milkweed, which I'm not because it's a bully plant, <laughs> uh, get them before they erupt like that because it's a devil to take off those giant parachutes. Um, but of course much preferred by monarch uh, caterpillars in my experience are the much slenderer tender leaves of the butterfly milkweed top right and I think that's Quarles milkweed actually in the bottom right but swamp milkweed is my favorite and of course you can get those pods just before they split and you open it up and there's nice brown seeds and then with your thumbnail holding the, the pappus the, the white parachute things and just sort of stroke off and you get all the seeds without any of those annoying parachute things. If you're crazy enough to take it indoors, you end up with uh, thousands of little white parachutes all over your kitchen table. <laughs> so there we are. In general, that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, I use, uh, you know, old paper bags or sometimes just an old flower pot or something um, to collect the seeds and seed pods I then pop those uh, indoors into small paper bags coin envelopes usually the smallest one but bigger if you've got a large volume I then use a series of three old kitchen sieves that we had a uh, 16th of an inches gauge that really suits quite a lot of these seeds um, and some of them like bergamot and the mints are even finer and certainly Great lulabelia and uh, cardinal flower, tiny, tiny, teeny seeds. So if you wanted to separate those from the chaff, you'd need a much finer one. Um, but it doesn't really matter if you've got some chaff in there because you're sowing the whole caboodle within which are the seeds. So, And then markers and labels, you really need those. Um, as we'll see in a couple of pictures, I have learned that if you just put one type of label into your tray by the time the spring comes around it could have gone so I put both a tape label uh, uh, on horizontally on the side and a, um, a marked label vertically into the potting soil um, protocols and then Lots of additional resources. Many of you will be familiar with these type of sites, but Prairie Moon Nursery, I find uh, in Wisconsin, are really collated some of the best materials for many species that uh, we are dealing with here. So thoroughly recommend their collations. Okay, moving on quickly to the extraction and cleaning there. Um, I forget exactly what that species is, but you know, one of the Rudbeckia uh, cone flower types. Stick it on the sieve, just brush it along, along with your thumb and quickly in the bottom right um, underneath the sieve in your you know kitchen cooking bowl or whatever you've got a nice mix. It could be half and half chaff and seed but that's just fine for me and you can keep that dry in the envelopes. Usually don't seal the envelopes, keep them with the top open. Here's in my basement, which is, is dry and without bugs and fungi and things, um, there they are, just standing upright, um, stored, and uh, some of them from two years ago are still there, and I'm going to use them. So, to the germination. So, of course, the simplest form is just to find a piece of ground, ideally before the frost, clear it of all the vegetation and roots you can do that manually if you want or you can use a solarization method with landscape fabric or old carpet for five months during the summer or you can use the lasagna cardboard method um, many of you are familiar with those scatter the seeds cover with a very shallow sprinkling of soil and then some leaves uh, will help and mark and label the area um, and if you think the squirrels are going to start digging, then of course cover the whole thing with chicken wire. <laughs> Otherwise, seasons planting, seeding, and then let winter and nature do its thing with its natural cycle. The bottom left picture is the Fairview Nursing Home, Gladstone and Dundas, and that picture was taken um, 
exactly 10 months after the top picture was taken. So in early December, we did that digging and clearing of a really boring bit of grass. And in the very next season, it had turned into that, which is quite amazing through a mixture of seeding, but also then some spring plantings, but huge display of flowers in the first year, some of which, especially the um, Enothera evening primrose, of course, sprouted up and um, now it's a bit of a problem. It's everywhere. <laughs> Anyway, that's the winter sowing method. Now I have to try and get down to the next slide, which my machine isn't doing. I hmm, don't know why that is. Might just be that lag again. Yeah, it might be. We're, we're getting lots of requests for, uh, <laughs> for your video, Pete. Um, if you feel like giving it a shot, what do you mean? Oh, my video, my face. Yeah. Yeah, to to okay. see your face as you speak. I've turned mine yeah. off. Just All right. There we are. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I look the same. You see that now, Janid? Yeah. Yeah. You can see Okay. You yeah. And... There's a bit of a lag here. But anyway, so the second option is the one that I piloted for a couple of years. And uh, I just call it the outdoor tray method. But I had been learning every year new things. So there in the top picture, um, this is basically you, you put the seeds in potting soil into a tray. You put some wire mesh on top to protect it from animals, especially squirrels. And you stick it outside and then you're basically simulating nature in a controlled way. Uh, last year, we seed sitters um, did what that bottom right picture is showing, which is we took the old uh, trays that uh, four inch pots are put in and we just put the soil in, scattered the seeds, away you go. Well, most of us had ridiculously high germination rates. So I had thousands and thousands of little seedlings, which on the one hand is a good problem to have. But if you're like me, uh, when those things get three inches high, you can't possibly throw them out and put them in the compost. So six o'clock in the morning, right through May and June, I was out there potting up <laughs> thousands of seedlings. So this year, I'm going to be a little bit more selective. So Sharon Harris, who is a Project Swallowtail member uh, on Edna Avenue, she for a number of years has done the, um, the small four plug trays the little ones that you get your tomatoes and peppers in from the nursery in the spring and those uh, allow you to plant in each cell uh, you know 10 or so seeds and I'm going to do more of those uh, in conjunction with the 72 cell and 36 cell uh, Lee Valley plug trays they have really nice deep uh, four inch um, stems so these deep rooted native plant species do very well and you can have multiple seeds in each of those and the the seedlings will grow to the the height of you know three inches or so no problem you then pull them out and um, separate them carefully then put them into individual pots so that's the method that um, i'm recommending now um, in smaller units, not in big chunks and blocks. So you end up with forests of uh, the species you've picked. And it is essential to have uh, ideally half inch or quarter inch uh, or even one inch um, chicken wire on top. Otherwise the squirrels that seem to be everywhere would just basically chew through. Now I've got this lag in advancing slides for some reason, so. I will okay so we'll go to the what do you plant in these what do you plant the seeds into so the top middle picture is the standard um, mix of inert peat moss and perlite pro mix bx is the most common one that people use that's got no nutrients added but it's a has mycorrhizal fungi added and that seems to be a pretty good medium for seeds to get started and push their little roots down. 
but they can only go so far because the soil there has no nutrients in it. So there's the top right um, gray and white. Oh, you can probably see my cursor there. That's the Promix BX. It's less expensive in a big bale than the other ones. But um, here below is nutrients added Promix product and other gardeners. You know, these are equivalents of triple mix for your beds with soil and other things added, but they're more expensive because they've got the nutrients added. So um, it's important to remember that when you come to potting up, you've got to add some form of nutrients and I'll cover that in a minute, uh, but that's only at the four inch pot stage. Right now in those uh, plug trays or um, seed trays, if you want a thousand seedlings, or hundreds, um, the Promix BX is your best deal. I think it's about $20 for a big bale like that. But a number of people have said, geez, peat, where does it come from? Well, you know, Canada's got a lot of peat, but in some parts of the world, certainly in Northwestern Europe, yeah, peat has been terribly over harvested. So the horticulture business has a problem and people are pushing to get certification uh, of peat harvesting doesn't exist in this part of the world. So if, you know, I, I really wanted to have a response to this. So I went back to what I remembered from my childhood, which was my parents taking me out to the old beach hangars in the English countryside, beach woods on chalk slopes, and digging into buckets in the back of the car, loads of stuff called leaf mold, which is really just hundreds of years of decayed, rich, um, leaves broken down by natural processes. So, and I went to a number of videos online and in the US there's some people who specialize in producing essentially potting mix and uh, wonderful soil from decomposing leaves. So I bought myself a works uh, leaf shredder and I put in the shredded leaves in hardwood leaves, not oaks because they're too tannic, into um, baskets or large um, contractors bags with aeration holes in the side and left it for now uh, now a year and here in the next picture there's some leaves i've just collected some of those um containers the leaves are about half broken down this is a um anaerobic um fungal breakdown uh, process unlike compost which involves a lot of uh, microbial and insect breakdown but one of my uh, wire cages, the one in the white here, it's produced stuff in the middle and at the bottom, which essentially is just like peat moss. And it looks completely clean. There's no sprouting seedlings. So there's a close up of it. And uh, I am going to try that this year in some of those little plug trays with uh, clear labels and see how it functions as a as a potting mix medium. And I'll try it in the four inch pots as a growing medium for the germinated seedlings. So there you go, bottom right, that's just a picture I showed last year. That's Jack in the pulpits that went in and then I sprinkled some soil over wire. And in fact, I germinated about 200 Jack in the pulpits last year without really doing anything to them. So that was good news. So, okay, this is a big change from last year. So last year we had September the 24th or something, we had this and some people, this video webinar thing, and some people, including me, went off and started sowing aft here. And of course, when we got to May, uh, a number of us realized that there were strange other seedlings in sprouting up in these trays and because those seedlings at the you know two dicotyledon stage and even up to two inches tall are very hard to tell one species from another so we were looking after them and in fact um, what was happening was uh, a number of windblown species like lamb's quarters um, and even ragweed and certainly Canada goldenrod right through till December. They were blowing in the wind and they were just finding a very nice place to land uh, between the, the wire gauze 
uh, cells. And of course, you ended up just growing lamb's quarters and Canada goldenrod and not knowing how to differentiate it from the species you did want. So I'm not recommending anybody start this now until at least mid November. And for me, it's going to be into December. Um, you can gauge what kind of weather trends are, but uh, you know, you can sew these trays up in your garage or somewhere a bit warmer if it's already started freezing outside, but it doesn't matter because you know, you're re the longer you leave it, the uh, fewer of these seed contaminants will actually land in your tray. There you go. So you leave it outside and it overwinters. Da -da 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 -da. There you go. And by that right hand picture, I'd move my trays from, you know, open areas uh, into a, a, a rack and I had a whole series of, I think I had 40 of these trays this spring, which is why I was exhausted by July. <laughs> but it was such exciting time. And you'll see there, there's my horizontal side labels, which actually proved far more effective than little lollipop labels in the top. And uh, I'd recommend doing both, but um, the side labels were easily the best. And I knew exactly what was in each tray. So there you go. One thing with that method is that you don't get lovely big potted plants in May. They don't come till June and July because you're not forcing the plants, you're letting them do their natural thing. Uh, there's really two options for forcing them so that like the nurseries um, that want to catch the spring market when everyone gets spring planting fever in May. Um, cold moist stratification that is needed by most of these seed uh, plant species uh, to break the seed dormancy. You basically pop it in um, either sand, uh, moist sand in a plastic bag or between moist um, kitchen towel put the seeds in the fridge um, for one or two months. You can go online and find some precise recommendations about the timing, but um, you can also pop it in and out of the freezer and the fridge. And I know Douglas Counter, who's on the call, he'd never done this before, but I got him started in about March. And Douglas did the accelerated thing, and I'm hopefully he can tell us a little bit about how it went. but. His winter was very short from the point of view of the seeds and he got remarkable success and seedlings as a result. So um, the other thing you can do, and uh, Jeannie McKnight out in Mississauga, the Blooming Boulevards and Ryan and a number of other people use grow lights in the basement and that's fine. Uh, you can do that um, and it actually is a nice activity, but whether you're doing that or eager to get going in February uh, by putting, you know, seed trays to germinate with moisture in the windowsill with some natural light coming in when the sun's starting to get strong. I mean, you have to be careful that you don't start too early because you don't want to end up by the end of April with a whole bunch of leggy, you know, eight inch plants if it's still too cold outside and uh, you gotta time it fairly smartly. Okay, that was my covering slide. Of course, it's a dramatic one, but I was totally blown away by, you know, year two, there it is exactly as in the picture books, uh, Blazing Star and many of these other ones. In fact, this year, more than in the previous year, some of my plants were flowering in the first year. So they'd been a seed, uh, in the ground in the potting soil in February and March and then by July and August the plants were in uh, seemingly full flower. Normally it takes um, a couple of years before they really mature like that. Anyway oh that's just a picture I'd used before running from the top left that's germination in my window you see the the plants leaning towards the light that's a south facing bay window then of course in early May, you've got to introduce them to the outside. The sun's strong, um, in fact, too, sometimes too strong, so it will burn some of these tender leaves off. But then you have to bring them in overnight because it's, you know, zero degrees. And these things have been 
molly coddled in, in your window. So another reason is it's good to do this, but you have to watch the weather avidly and watch the squirrels as you put them out. I just like the lower um, management intensity um, seed tray outdoors method for producing significant numbers of these things anyway. So this is just a summary, you know, generally the um, dormancy is broken by one to two months of cold with moisture, um, sometimes dry though. So if you go, you see there, there's a number of species specific um, stratification needs. Um, some of the shrubs and trees seem to be even the big seeded nuts seem to be uh, much more complicated to germinate. So I did refer to this quite a lot, this Prairie Moon nursery spreadsheet, which was at that point the only one I had found um, running through by species. What type of dry or moist or days or does it need seed scarification? And there you go. So those resources with a bit of homework um, will pay dividends. Okay, so that's the main seed thing. Uh, I will assume that you'll all be successful to some degree and have a whole bunch of the seeds that you want. Um, you'll see in the bottom right there, I invested in two or three of these little four shelf um, plastic greenhouses. They were only about 40 bucks or so from Rona, but those were fantastic because it allowed me to keep the squirrels out and to control moisture and temperature inside. I didn't put a um, light bulb or a heater underneath, but I found that when these little seedlings in early May were about that big, the native plant seedlings uh, were totally happy and I monitored the temperature in there. They're totally happy with the minus five degrees inside my greenhouse overnight. And then by the time you got to eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning, even in mid-March, the temperature was already scooting up to eight degrees. And then of course, some days it was way too hot in there, even in March with the greenhouse effect. So I had to cut holes in the top to allow the heat to escape. So, you know, there we are, four inch pots seem to work, all the yogurt containers, uh, work fantastically just drill about eight holes in the bottom and start collecting them now if you haven't got a good supply of pots thank you to those of you who've returned pots to my backyard front yard porch i've got actually thousands of pots now um but i, I need them so another thing that you have to get hold of if you're not getting one of these more expensive mixed uh, soil, uh, potting soil mixes um, for your four inch pot that you put in this lovely little three inch seedling into by the time you get to mid-May, let's say, um, is some slow release NPK fertilizer. And there's a few of those available. The one I was using most was four months. So it's spreading over that four month period, which is really the longest my seedlings will be in those small pots. And that's what a number of the uh, native plant nurseries use as well. So I just copied them. Uh, and then, then you're off basically. Uh, you have to make sure you put the shade species trays in the shady part of the garden and um, sunny ones in the sunny area. But then you have to stop the sunny ones drying out and don't overwater, just do um, periodic deep water. And I'm sure Janaid and Kathleen will uh, establish a few more uh, updated webinars as we go, right? That's my zigzag zag goldenrod. Uh, I must have been a thousand seedlings in that tray, god damn it. <laughs> and I, I eventually solved the squirrels. We're nearly at the end, Janaid, thank you. Um, because there were a pair of squirrels that two years ago just taught their kids, oh, Turn left when you get to that garden and there's plenty of things to eat and dig up. So I eventually through having wire everywhere, broke that habit and they, they eventually gave up. It's an optimal foraging thing from their point of view. So in wrap up, um, make sure you get all your neighbors to leave the leaves. Don't let them crazily rake them up and stick them in the yard waste bags. 
watch the webinars and keep composting everything you can. Um, even if you don't make leaf mold, um, the compost is invaluable and turn it regularly. There you go. Thank you. 40 minutes. <laughs> That was incredible, considering how many tech issues uh, we had kicking this thing off. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. still stuck on time. Thank you so much, Pete. Okay. Uh, and we actually have a few questions lined up already. Um, <clears throat> and just when I thought that native plant propagation couldn't get, you know, more like deeper, you go ahead and start creating your own soil. <laughs> Well, as Ben, as ben Porchuk says, I mean, and Mathis Navik, I mean, they learned a long time ago because they've been doing this much more than me. Everything is about the soil. Yeah, if you don't understand that and get that right, then you'll waste a lot of time and effort. Right. So I'm just going to take uh, a couple of quick minutes. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Wonderful. So, <laughs> great picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, on the coattails of all the incredible information that Pete has just shared with us, uh, I want to tell everybody that's currently watching, and for those of you who will be watching later, um, that uh, Project Swallowtail last year did actually go do a seed sitters program. So, we had Pete and a whole bunch of our community volunteers. Um, go through everything that Pete spoke to you about. And uh, we had 40 participants that produced over 2,000 plants, uh, 2,200. We don't, I still don't know where all these plants have then gone. It's been an incredible spreading of uh, joy and community gathering and uh, engagement over fall and winter months that can be quite hard, especially during the pandemic. Um, and so we're hoping to, you know, do a bigger and better version of the program this year with uh, a lot of the lessons learned from last year applied. Um, and so, as Pete said, you know, we're going to be starting it a bit later. So um, watch for uh, a newsletter come November for what the Seed Sitters program is going to be like this year and what opportunities you have to get uh, sources of seeds from us. Um, as well as our uh, nursery partners who we're, we're working on a few exciting things with. Um, so with that, I want to tell you that uh, now is the time for all of your burning questions. Uh, and we already have a few in the chat, so I'm just going to kick them off. Um, so the first question we have, Pete, is um, where do you get the seed trays at this time of year? Good question. You can buy them at a few places, um, but it's, it's it's hard now. You can buy them online in bulk. Uh, usually, those are U.S. distributors. Um, I've been stockpiling them, and of course, those of you who came to the March and the particularly the May webinar would have heard us gleefully saying that the Loblaws Garden Centres in all of those parking lots actually instituted a uh, return policy so you could go i went to my local one almost every day and basically took them up on it and i got pots and trays so you know i have some but um you know i probably don't have a, a spare hundred or so but you can find online but it's a bit silly to buy one or two online i mean it's a fair question Janae maybe we could have a place where people um, drop off extra trays that they've got and other people could come and get them if they needed one or two. But frankly, you know, my advice is actually, unless you know you need a thousand zigzag goldenrods, just get the little small, you know, put those in a, a box with drain holes in the bottom and you just need 10 of them. That's enough for a 200 seedlings that's a great idea so um last year we did actually have or actually just this season um we had a couple of spots where people were able to come and drop off pots and seed trays 
and other folks would um, be able to pick them up. Um, and that mostly ended up with a lot of folks coming to your backyard and dropping off the pots, which then were primarily used by you. So this year, as we expand and you know try to really empower more people to to take this on, um, I'm going to focus a bit more on the drop off location that um, this last year we were partnered with the St Anne's Anglican Church, um, and so you know as as I'll share all the information with you for seat sitters this year, um, you know hopefully we'll be able to continue that partnership and that can still be a location mm. where people can come and get trays from and drop trays off um through through the season well the other thing the other thing i'd suggest is that block ambassadors and their adjacent block ambassadors uh i'm assuming by now some of you know who your nearby folks are you could actually coordinate this yourselves both for pots and trays um at a more regional level because I, I know you know diane and kit and douglas in etobicoke kind of can do that but they don't want to be having to drive all the way downtown uh, or out to the pocket in the East End. But you could do it regionally for all of these things um, in a similar way that I did, but more locally. Awesome. Thank you, Pete. OK, so uh, now getting into some questions out of the chat okay so the first one being can we reuse last summer's potting soil i say for the inert potting soil which is really just a you know a medium for the roots to go into to settle down and absorb some water um the answer is yes yeah i've been doing that but if you've had lots of hungry seedlings sucking out all of the um, minerals and nitrogen potassium and phosphorus then you'd need to um, add some more you could use it but then if you added the slow release um, granules at the right concentration that would be fine too and other years i've I mixed in you know one part of sheep manure or composted sheep manure to three parts of potting soil and that seemed to work fine too but you got to got to feed the seedlings as, when you get to the four inch pot stage. Um, and Carol asks, do you ever use the milk jug method with native seeds? Do you, do you know? Oh, no, I'm Carol's going to tell us what it is. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Carol, can you type into the chat what the milk jug method is? I don't we're, know that one. we're not fully sure. And then we've got uh, Douglas. Hi, Douglas. Look, I got your art on my wall. That's 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 all your work. Uh -huh. OK, uh, Douglas asks, did you add a layer of leaves on the seed trays after seeding? It was hard to see in some photos. And if so, then how thick should the leaf layer be? Yeah, thanks, Douglas. Uh, I did last year, but, but I was making it up. I was thinking, OK, they're out there. I want to simulate nature as much as I can. So I added the leaves, uh, my shredded leaves from my big powerful leaf grinder onto the top of the um, chicken wire. And of course, some of those smaller parts fell down and I was beginning to get a bit worried that these teeny tiny little seedlings wouldn't be able to push through if there's too many leaves on top. But in the end, uh, it was fine. And when I got to say, late April and the you know the bad frosts were really gone I just brushed off all of the remaining leaves from the top of the um the wire mesh and the leaves that were there on the surface had fallen through the fragments had fallen through on top of the surface of the potting soil it wasn't a barrier for the seeds there wasn't so much of it but I wouldn't advocate adding big layers of um leaves on top and I think it's just fine actually to not add any leaves would you just go with w whatever leaves naturally yeah i think so Un unless you're underneath a giant black walnut or red oak and it dumps you know there those leathery leaves on top but it, it wouldn't if you put the thing out in late november december that wouldn't usually be an issue 
Okay, so we don't quite know what the milk jug method is, um, but I wanted to ask you a couple more questions about the, um, the soil. So in terms of, oh, so Carol says the winter sowers use a milk jug to create a greenhouse effect. So you oh, cut oh, it no. at the four inch mark, put soil and seeds in tape and then like, and tape it shut. And then you leave the lid off yeah. and put it outside. Oh, okay. I've seen something where people put an upside down jug onto an area it, essentially it's a greenhouse but i've always wondered if there's enough ventilation in there but um yeah that's that's what i was gonna say i don't um i don't know carol send us some details i mean i'm always interested in new innovative effective techniques yeah yeah so this year i'm gonna be trying um sort of the out like just the outdoor method but I'm going to attempt to do them in root pouches oh, and, yeah. and then just have larger plants to pot up. Uh, yeah. This last year I found that I ended up seeding trays and then I planned to, to pot them at like different life stages. And it just, I, I really just didn't have enough time mm. to like put them into, you know, the, 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 the plug, plug pots I don't know why I did it but I put them in there and then you know I just didn't get them planted in time so then I yeah. had to put them into the four inch pots and um yeah so I'm just wondering if growing them in a larger overwintering container will make it easier to just transplant like larger plants and, yeah and I think it would yeah and and that's a good point because whatever size of flower pot or container as long as it's got drainage you can, you know, clear it and put your seeds on top, put a piece of chicken wire on top and just leave it alone. And then if you get 500 germinating in a, in a big pot, well, then you can just thin them as you want or take some out, but leave the ones that are in there so that they don't actually need to be transplanted. Yeah, just need a container with some anti-squirrel stuff on top. Um, okay, so we've got a hand up from the crowd, so I will allow Larry, you had a question. Larry, can you, can you hear me? He's on if mute. So, I have asked you to unmute if you can, if you have your question, uh, while we wait. Um, Linda asks, I'm not having much luck collecting seed trays, but I've begun collecting the plastic trays some fruits are sold in. I cut the tops off and plan to use them too. They have ventilation and I hope will last the entire winter. Um, probably, I'm not yeah, quite probably sure what the yeah. fruit, fruit plastic trays are, but well, is that like styrofoam? There's some clear ones with holes in the bottom, like you get your peaches and nectarines in. Ah, okay, okay, that, those, okay. Those would do fine, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, Carol has shared some resources for the method. Thank you very much. I will send those off to Pete. Thanks. And, uh, okay, so Olivia asks, when collecting wild seed, what geographic range is considered appropriate? Uh, so, for example, uh, she has some aster seeds from Wolf Island near Kingston. Would they be okay to plant in Toronto? And now we get into eco zones and eco regions oh. and <laughs> eco types. Yeah. Um, but I, th okay, so you're going from Kingston to Toronto. So it, this is kind of a case by case basis, I would say. And it also depends on the species. You know, you might, if you're bringing in some really, rare aster that really just kind of grows in a very limited range um probably not great but if you're bringing in like a calico aster in terms of genetic diversity it's probably you know just going to add to the population in some way um 
but then in terms of larger geographic moves, uh, you definitely want to be very considerate of the range of the plants that you're moving. And uh, for most cases, if you're, you know, moving things within like the GTA or, you know, like within two to three hours east or so, um, if you're not going off into the, you know, the, the Algonquin Park, like um, Boreal Shield area further north and so on, uh, you should be generally okay. Um, but what do you, what do you say, Pete? I, I agree with that. Yeah. And particularly coming back into Toronto, probably fine. But there are some species clearly that are restricted to the Carolinian zone. They just about natural range coming up to Toronto. And if it wasn't for climate change, you'd probably say, no, no, it's really not going to survive in Kingston or Ottawa or Huntsville, you know, forget it. But I think, well, look at today's weather. <laughs> um, and the severity of the winters isn't what it used to be. So, you know, I, I know Ryan and others are pretty strong on this because they've studied taxonomy and genetics and everything. But I have a fairly relaxed view and I think, geez, I mean, you know, our plant communities are so mobile and dynamic and influenced by all these species that have come not 100 miles, but, you know, 10,000 miles genetically from where they should be. So, yeah, I'm, I think within Southern Ontario, give it, give it a go. It's not a big deal. Diane does bring a good point up in the chat that there could be local virus infections or diseases introduced by transporting plants. So now that goes into where you're sourcing your plants from. Um, I would very much say that, like, first off, if anytime you're harvesting seeds and you're collecting, um, you got to make sure that you have the proper permits if you are collecting from, you know, a provincial park. Uh, if you are collecting in a public park, it depends on your jurisdiction, what is and is not allowed. But, you know, if you're moving uh, plants from gardens, that's where you might have, you know, I don't know, powdery mildew or to some extent, you know, other, other diseases that um, you could bring with you. The diseases that come to mind immediately for me that are of concern, I, I think of um, for trees and they're they're generally to do with like the pests that you could introduce but um, I'm not too sure on the, the the kinds of diseases that can spread it, spread in native plant communities because generally I feel they're they're quite resilient but any thoughts on that Pete? No I like like you I, I'm not aware of many you know plant pathogens uh but I think that would be a good topic because there's clearly not much um, online and literature about it. But there might be some examples. People could share those if they become aware of them with others. And then, you know, if, if you see that wild strawberries from eastern Ontario are suddenly infected by something, then it's a sort of red flag and everyone would benefit from that. But it's not it's not very common. So. There's a lot, lots of potential concerns, but this isn't one of the really big ones in, in my opinion yet. But bring, bring them forward through the uh, Facebook uh, chat rooms of Project Swallowtail for sure. And I, okay, so last but not least, is it generally better to put seed trays in a sunny or shady area, like a second floor deck or on the ground? It doesn't make any difference uh, when you put them out in December, just let them have winter full bore. But when you come to um, March, the sun's strong and it will, uh, for a species that is a shade loving species, you don't want to have that tray baked in sun in March because it will dry out fairly quickly and those little seedlings can quickly get burned up. So put those trays for shade species in a shady setting. You, you know, you're mimicking its natural shady habitat. And for the sunny ones, put those sunny species, you know, the asters and the milkweeds and uh, bergamots and everything, put them out into a sunny area and make sure they don't dry out too. Once the seedlings 
actually germinate. Um, keep make sure you keep your eye on it and keep it moist because they need water at that stage. But they'll they'll take the sun for sure. Awesome. So uh, Diane did uh, make bring up a good point in the chat, and I would, I will say that when transporting plants. Um, what we're talking about here is moving seeds. So we're not saying dig up somebody's, you know, anise has up and bring it down here because anytime you start getting into soil transport, you can, I studied uh, European fire ants in Southern Ter Ontario, and this is how they spread was through native plant nursery or plant nurseries in general and contaminated soil and rubble and so on. So we're talking here specifically about moving seed and what type of effect that might have on the genetic diversity um, or you know potential pathogen introduction uh, through through seed transfer rather than actual plants because that's a whole nother whole nother ball game. Um, so on that point, Larry, thank you very much. Um, he didn't have a question, so. I think we are good to go. Uh, oh, absolutely. So uh, we have a final question by Diane, but um, I, I can follow up with you uh, separately, Diane, um, and uh, uh, to talk about all the different roles that seed sitters can play. Um, so on that note, I would like to thank everybody for being here and sharing this power-packed hour with us. Uh, I'm incredibly thankful to Pete Ewens for sharing um, all of his knowledge with us and the learnings from just this past year. And um, as I said, I will be in touch in the coming weeks, uh, probably by early November, um, and how you can get involved with the Seed Sitters Project and how you can um, create native plant gardens of your own and spread your love and joy everywhere you go. Um, any last words, Pete? Yeah, I just say uh, great job, Janaid. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you're a, a mind of information as well as an excellent host and, uh, you know, admin. And I think you succeeded in uh, getting the thing recorded. So well done. Thank you. Oh, shucks. Thanks, Pete. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I think it's recorded. So <laughs> thank you, everybody. And uh, we will talk okay. to you soon. Bye, everyone. Take care.